It's so exciting to see so many bright faces this early in the morning to have a discussion, discourse, and to learn from each other about uh, Hispanic serving institutes. Let me introduce myself. My name is Dr. Timo Rico. I am the Executive Director for Student Affairs Assessment for Vice Chancellor Raguerin. And today, I'm here to uh, facilitate and moderate our panel. Before we get started with our panel, I just want to provide you with a uh, general overview of our structure. 25, in the last 25 years since uh, legitimizing HSIs in uh, federal legislation, HSIs have increased over 185% since 1994 to 2018, where we had approximately 189 institutions to 539. In that process, we also had 362 institutions that were identified as emerging institutions. That, and that included UC Davis. I want to highlight that in 2012, UC Davis aggressively began as part of its HSI summit with regional partners in the K-12 and higher education system to engage towards the path of HSI. Today, we uh, have three panelists in which each one of them will be presenting content for 10 minutes, giving you a perspective, the history, the journey, as a collective in which we've been building a framework and approach to understanding our campus-specific needs. So I want to take this opportunity to introduce our panelists. First, in the order of presentations, um, our HSI task, Raquel Aldana, who is the professor at, here at our School of Law and who also served our Associate Vice Chancellor of Diversity uh, here at our campus for academics. Raquel was also highly involved with student affairs in developing many of the services and frameworks that have been developed in that process. Secondly, Dr. Francisco Hernandez, who is a, a UC retired, but has been proactively and actively been engaged representing the community as a whole, not only in Sacramento, but all the regional, uh, all the areas of California in different capacities, who also serves as the co-chair for the HSI Community Council. And lastly, and most importantly, Alondra Avitia Ramos, who's our current undergraduate student here on campus and serves um, as part of the UC Davis student and HSI undergraduate student advisory board members. I believe, and, and I am very grateful for their contributions to our campus because these members have invested time, hours, thought, research to engage the community as a whole towards becoming an emerging and aspiring Hispanic serving institute. So please welcome the panel. <laughs> Unfortunately, Raquel has, is not able to attend today, but she is with us in spirit. And recognizing, oh, Raquel. <laughs> it's great to see you. <laughs> So I present to you Raquel. It's great to, to, to be updated. Thank you, Timo. Without I, I further ado, that was part virtually. of our skill. We want to create some laughter around here, right? Without further ado, Raquel Aldana. Thank you so much, Timo. It's, um, I'm so sorry that I cannot be there in person, but I am definitely with you in spirit and virtually, actually. Yes. So, um, <laughs> Well, let me talk a little bit about the uh, process of uh, the HSI task force at UC Davis. Um, in 2018, Chancellor May formed the task force to forge a vision for what it should mean for UC Davis, a selective research intensive land grant institution to become a premier Hispanic serving institution. At the time, you know, now five years ago, we thought we had the numbers to satisfy the federal HSI designation. Turns out we were wrong. We would learn subsequently that the narrow construction of Hispanic discounted AB 540, DACA, and undocumented students from the denominator of the 25% equation. This affected our numbers, at least the percentages. The realization, however, only solidified the ripeness of the HSI project at UC Davis. We needed to reclaim, reframe, and even redefine who should count 
and what it should mean to be presente and represented at a Hispanic serving institution like UC Davis in the state of California. So then, it to, then and today, it turns out, as you heard from Chancellor May, that we were already serving per headcount more Hispanic students than the overwhelming number of HSIs across the United States. And this is simply due to the sheer size of our institution, which in the current academic year boasts of over 40,000 undergraduate and graduate students combined. As you heard, of these 8,620 students are Hispanic. I use that term because it's what the federal government relies on, which is more Hispanic students than are served by 89% of the currently designated HSIs and 99% of the emerging HSIs. And I start my remarks here because it was important for the HSI task force to guide UC Davis in recognizing that it could not easily fit and should not try to conform to the HSI federal designation. I'm not saying that the designation is irrelevant or unimportant, but it doesn't track our history or that of any of the UCs in the state of California for that matter. The HSI designation was born as an imperfect expression of a civil rights struggle for Latinos, Latinas, Latine, Latinx for educational equity. At the time of the law's creation, the data showed that the so-called de facto concentration of Hispanic students in higher education revealed disparities in resources and outcomes for the student population that the federal government tried to ameliorate by throwing, quite frankly, insignificant amounts of money and uh, forced these institutions to compete for solutions for what should be considered structural and endemic problems. The problem with this narrative for UC Davis and other UCs is that the so-called concentration of Latino, Latina, Latine, Latinx students for us has been by intentionality. It has been a persistent project by pioneros with rather recent histories and we fought hard to ensure that at least a solid representation of our students who comprise over 50% of all graduates in high school from the state were educated at the top public research universities whose obligations is to serve the state of California. And I and the, HSS, the HSI task force be damned if we were going to fall into the narrative that this new concentration of our community at UC Davis somehow made us a deficit institution. To the contrary, we remained a top university. We were becoming increasingly selective and our students were not being handed admissions. Indeed, the data did not bear this out. We were recruiting the cream of the crop. And even today, we, the UCs are educating nearly a 4% of the nearly 1.4 million Hispanic students who are graduating from California schools. And yet we were underperforming. The data reveals some gaps in important metrics, like the over-enrollment of our students in non-credit remediation courses, lower graduation rates in four years as compared to other student demographics, and under-enrollment in graduate programs. So we needed to take a serious look and ask the serious questions of why. Let me pause with you here and short, share quickly with you just a little bit of the vision and work that the UC Davis Task Force attempted to capture um, in order to really re reclaim this more complex narrative and story of UC Davis as an HSI. First, the Reclaiming and Reframing Project. The HSI Task Force became an important opportunity to recontextualize how we should understand HSIs for UC, HSI for UC Davis as a land grant research-based selective public university. We relied on our identity, our values and mission to craft an ambitious HSI identity that better fit our story and our potential. I will offer only three examples. First, we intentionally used the word rising scholar to refer to our students as an intentional effort to move away from the deficit framework and to recognize and embrace the amazing talent and opportunity that it represented to have a greater and larger presence of Latino, Latine, Latinx, and other students of color at UC Davis and in the state of California. We weren't just doing uh, a pipeline as a, as a gift 
to ourselves, but rather we were gifting the state of California the new generation of leaders. We relied on our land grant mission to discuss our obligations to the Central Valley and to the potential to really improve equity for rural and agricultural justice in the state. We focused our research mission to both expand the HSI goals into ensuring that our research touches the lives of our community, community meaningfully, both by engaging members of our community as the researchers, but also by partnering with our communities in a culturally responsive way to respond to their needs and the questions that they have. Second, we focused on documentation and institutional accountability. We knew we would be most effective in the reclaiming reframing project if we spoke the language of a research university and if we substantiated our claims with data. Our report is long and it's chock full of data. And let me just offer a few examples of the things that we tried to do through the data. We connected dots related to admissions, our selectivity, and other performance outcome metrics to focus on institutional accountability for anything that might indicate underperformance. Don't blame the students. Focus on how we teach, what type of research we do, how we conduct the research, who's teaching, are we being culturally responsive? Do students feel a sense of belonging such that, the, that their full potential can be realized? We also documented the role of the pioneros, those who came and remained fighting to lead us in this point. Uh, to, to this point, we wanted to honor their legacy and increase their visibility. And you'll hear a little bit more about the Pioneros project at some point in during the program. We also benefited from broad, broader data and context to remain humble and committed despite our gains. We relied a lot, for example, on the yearly accounting by the Campaign for College opportunity to remind us that despite our gains, we have such a long way to go to equitably educate and serve our Latino, Latina, Latinx uh, students in the state. And finally, the visioning project. We dare to be ambitious. Our report contained over 80 recommendations. Many joked that it reads more like a thesis than a task force report. That's all right. As we said in our letter that accompanies the report, there is a saying in Spanish, no se puede tapar el sol con un dedo. The recommendations in the report embark on an equity project and call for transformative changes and bold action. Our recommendations spanned across four phases of our obligations and missions as a land grant institution. Our obligations pre-UC Davis to grow the pipeline, our obligations during the UC Davis experience to nurture our students, our obligations post UC Davis through our students to serve the state and our obligation as a public university to serve the needs of our community. We also said in the same letter, visionary, even inspirational recommendations lose meaning if there is no chance of implementation. For this reason in the document, we also prioritize the first steps towards implementation and creative metrics for assessing progress. We are not quite there, but some of those things like hiring Dr. Lena Mendez as our HSI director is, is exciting and shows great promise. I finally want to close my remarks by acknowledging that the HSI task force report integrated the voices of our students, of our faculty, of our alumni, of our community leaders, and of our public officials. We were a 30 strong task force. You can find the full list of who participated on page 85 of the report. We held town halls. We conducted our projects over pan con cafecito. Many of us wrote and revised the report well into past midnight for several months. It was our labor of love to this university and to our community. And we're proud that it has served as a foundation to forge a vision that is bold and visionary for our community. Thank you. Thank you very much, Raquel. That is a very thorough and overview of the HSI Task Force Report, in which I invite you to uh, download at the uh, DEI website here at the UC Davis uh, site. 
Um, in addition, there is an implementation plan that's available that if you're interested in seeing the framework and the approaches, you're more welcome to, share, uh, to download that from the website. With that said, I want to transition to our second uh, panelist, uh, Dr. Francisco Hernandez, who's the co-chair of the Hispanic Serving Institute Community Chair. So, Dr. Hernandez. Oh, good morning. Thank you for the opportunity to present before you. My name is Francisco Hernandez, and I am representing the HSI Community Council. Uh, the other members of the Community Council are here, Robert Aguayo, Tari Aguilera, Caroline, Caroline Cabillas, Sara Martinez, Jose Michel, Kathy Rodriguez, and Ramon Urbano. All of them are UC Davis graduates. I am the exception. Uh, I graduated from a, from a small school in the East Bay, which I think is ranked number one in the country or the world, I'm not sure. <laughs> <clears throat> I also worked for, and sometimes against, the University of California for over 30 years before retiring as Vice Chancellor at Santa Cruz. Um, my own experience then is combined with that of my colleagues, and that totals about 350 years of activism. 350 years of being disruptors, I think, is the new title that uh, Pablo has given us. <clears throat> we are well experienced disruptors. Um, it's just a different and kinder way of saying we're old when we say 350 years. As members of, of the Community Council, we believe this. We believe that UC Davis is an excellent institution. However, we believe more strongly that UC Davis could have been even better if it had allowed the current and future scholars in our community to participate in the future of the campus. If you think Davis is great now, imagine how great it would have been if it had exploited the genius in our community, whether they be rising scholars or established scholars. Just imagine. We believe that UC Davis can be the model HSI Research one HSI in the country. We believe that strongly. However, we also believe that UC Davis cannot meet its full potential unless we as alumni and community members continue our activism on behalf of the community. So these beliefs then guide our efforts. We meet regularly with campus representatives we discuss critical topics, admissions, outreach, retention activities, plus faculty, staff, and administrative hiring. I want to add that our sessions last about an hour and a half, both to accommodate the information we receive, an analysis of that information, and our feedback uh, and recommendations. Last year, we, we held a total of six official meetings to cover these topics. In addition, we met with the people from DEI at other times to discuss other campus developments. So far this year, we've met on admissions and faculty hiring. We met with four deans uh, to discuss plans, their plans to hire more of our established scholars. In addition, this year we've agreed to four additional workshops to focus on enrollment management and, and retention. These workshops are going to feature uh, uh, access to data, a discussion of the campus efforts to increase uh, in, enrollments uh, of people from our community, and then our recommendations uh, from, the, from the community council. We held our first session on March the 9th that focused on admissions. And we're scheduled again in April, and that will focus on retention. We also hold regular meetings with the, with the campus leadership, uh, including the chancellor. And th those are to monitor progress, uh, or more accurately, the lack of progress, uh, <clears throat> and, in, and for us to try to accelerate the rate of change on the campus. We've met with the chancellor three times formally. We also have other meetings to discuss progress on the recommendations of the HSI report that were just mentioned. Now I'm going to say <clears throat> with a great deal of frankness, those have been our most difficult meetings because of our concerns over speedy progress 
or the lack of speedy progress. So at those meetings, the community members, we analyze data a little. We make lots of recommendations. We cajole a little. We advocate a lot. We nag when necessary. We criticize when appropriate. We congratulate if it's warranted and advocate on the behalf of the campus when we're asked. All of these meetings have one single aim, only one, progress, progress, and the faster the better. Now I do want you to know that the members of the HSI uh, Community Council are very involved with the campus. They serve on the alumni board. They serve on the foundation board. They serve on advisory committees, including search committees. They raise scholarship money, they contribute their own money, they contribute their own time, they organize alumni events, and they organize events for outreach or do anything else to assist the campus. And this involvement has, has, has produced changes, positive changes, sometimes in policy, sometimes uh, in the direct results of hiring. Let me be clear, we believe strongly that without the advocacy and the pressure and everything else that we do to, to motivate the campus, shall we say, some of the hires that you saw today would not have occurred. We know that to be true. And so we will continue um, our efforts. The members of the, this group, they do much for the campus but they want and they do much for the campus. What they want now is to do things with the campus, all, all to benefit our community. And we, we think too that this high level of involvement and the positive changes that are coming about, even though they are rare, they motivate us to do more and to provide more impetus and to push and push harder as it's because what we want to do is like they say in Hamilton, we want to be in the room where it happens. We want to be in the room where it happens. Without our participation, the University of California at Davis, and I'll say that's for the other campuses, without our participation, the university will be only a great campus and not a superb campus. Now we do also want to note, we meet often with campus representatives, and they do tell us, as they mentioned today, they're trying. They're trying to hire more faculty. They're trying to hire more staff. They're trying to find more graduate students. They're trying to find more students. They're trying, they're trying. The operative word is trying. But we have to point out one thing. The University of California does not grant tenure for trying. The University of California does not give anybody a degree for trying to pass their classes. The faculty do not give you credit for your courses for trying to finish your homework. Right? And so what we want simply is for the University of California at Davis to finish its assignments, <laughs> to finish the assignments that to finish the assignments that they gave themselves when they accepted the report. They accepted it, they took it. Do not put it on the shelf with the other reports. I was involved with the university for 30 years and then as a student also. All the reports are produced, some every five years, some every 10 years, and you can look, at, look for them in the library. Collecting dust, this report will not collect dust because we know what to do now. We are experienced disruptors. I also want to note that some of our people have been involved with the campus for 50 or 60 years. Since that time, this campus has created new professional schools, opened a world-class medical center, become an internationally known research institution, and has joined the ranks of the top schools in the country. High achievements, all of them. All we ask from UC Davis is to use the same skills, the same abilities that produced that progress 
and meet the commitments that they made to these graduates 60 years ago to meet the needs of the community. They said it then, they repeat it today. We just want them to finish their assignments. We will accept nothing less. I repeat, we will accept nothing less because all we have is time. We're old, we're retired, we can outflank anyone. <laughs> and we have nothing to lose, nothing to lose. We've been committed to, to our community for this time. We're just going to follow. And we're gonna continue our advocacy because we know two things. Something's going to happen and then there are others not in this room and others in this room that are continue when we can't. We will push until we can't and then after that somebody else will come along. Davis has provided us as alumni and, and community members access to the campus administration and to the activities. So we plan to exploit that access because we believe that the campus should exploit our energy and, and our expertise to become an HSI. We know a lot. We survived the university in spite of what the university did, not because of what the university did, and now we want it, we want to make the changes. Finally, I would ask that the campuses help us by identifying like-minded advisory groups so that we can learn from uh, each other. We ask also that UC convene, like it does with research people and admissions people and HSI people, to <clears throat> convene campus-based advisory committees so that we can learn from each other and best practices. Because we, we have excelled at being problem identifiers. We're really good at that. What we want to do is to be problem solvers. And so we ask the, the UC to help us. I want to thank you for being here today, and I want to thank you for listening to us today. I look forward to more discussions and more advocacy and a lot more disruption. Thank you. Thank you, Francisco. At this moment, I want to recognize uh, the committee council members because of their civic engagement. As Raquel mentioned, this is about an asset base. When we engage the community, its members, the university thrives as a whole. So Francisco, thank you for co-chairing and facilitating that process. Now, we want to provide you with the perspective of our undergraduates here at the Davis campus. And today we have a, a Londra who will be representing our student body, both the undergraduate, graduate, and the professional students. Welcome, Alondra. Hi, everyone. Buenos días. Buenos días. Ya son tardes. No días, ¿verdad? Buenos días. ¿Cómo están? I hope you all got here safely and the road was not too bad. Uh, my name is Alondra Vitia Ramos, pronouns she, her, ella, and I am a fifth year here at UC Davis with a sociology, Spanish, Chicanx studies major and a minor in education. I am from... <laughs> I am from Calexico, California, and I currently hold leadership positions in my sorority, Sigma Pi Alpha Sorority Incorporated, in my Greek council. I also volunteer at the Center for Chicanx Latinx Academic Student Success. I work as an involvement mentor for the Center for Student Involvement. And of course, I am a member of the first HSI Undergraduate Advisory Board. Yeah. <laughs> In lo personal, I love telling stories and hearing stories. So today, I will share with you all my story here at UC Davis. It was the April of 2018, and I was a senior of high school. I, ex I was accepted into a program called Aggie Senior Weekend, meant to show high school students what life at UC Davis can be like. And uh, it is hosted by the Student Recruitment and Retention Center. This was the very first time I had visited Davis. I do live 11 hours away, so this was the only opportunity I had. And once I left, I realized this was the institution that was going to provide me with a space and people that encouraged and supported my growth, both personal and academic. And spoiler alert, it did, because now here we are graduating. <laughs> During my first year, I did struggle a lot with homesickness, and it interfered with my academics to the point that it led me to being in academic probation. When I received the email notifying me of my academic situation, 
I, I tried to ignore it, um, but I did know eventually I would have to address it. And I did once the director of the Center for Chicanx Latinx Academic Student Success, also known as El Centro, reached out to me, um, asking me to meet with him at the center. I remember being very intimidated because I felt like I was in trouble. I felt like I had not just disappointed myself, but now these news had gotten out to other people, right? Uh, but on the contrary, it really felt very comfortable. It felt like I was just talking to one of my tios, and it, <laughs> it was a, a nice experience, especially being in that situation as a first year. Um, Cirilo did also give me a tour of the Centro and showed me the various resources it offered at that time. And with the years, it has increased uh, in various uh, resources we offer at the Centro. Although it was established in 2017, El Centro definitely has felt like it has been here forever. It has been a nice space to see it become much more known around campus, see it offer more resources, as to, such as tutoring, space to study, office use, diverse workshops, and even a new pantry. I am also very glad the Centro continues to be led by inspiring people like Rodrigo, Daisy, Roxanne over there. <laughs> that continue to support and guide us every day. After I checked in with Cirilio, I also checked in and met with my STEP peer advisor counselor. STEP is a program over the summer that also allows students to come and spend a couple of weeks, I believe it is a month now, uh, in Davis. They also gave me more information about resources for my mental health and for my academic support. Before coming to UC Davis, I did not know what mental health was or how to take care of my own health, mental health. And one of the first events I attended was Mental Menudo, a Chicanx Latinx issues for <laughs> health monthly at El Centro. The topic for the Mental Menudo that day was homesickness. And you can imagine the mess I was while eating my menudo and quesadillas Roxana Reyes made that day for us. It was a mix of yes, of being homesick, but I was also overwhelmed with the feeling of home I had. Everyone was talking, everyone was yelling, everyone saludándose de abrazo, ¿cómo estás? Bien, y toda. And it just felt like I was back home with my mom, my tias, and my cousins. And that's another thing about El Centro, that you might go in and not know anyone, but you will definitely leave knowing somebody new that day. And that is how I have created my community day by day. I go in, I meet someone new, and all of a sudden I have a new friend. Another amazing experience I've had the opportunity to be a part of is Adelante Mujeres, which is facilitated by, it was facilitated by Cristina Gutierrez uh, when I participated. I think the emotional support this group provided was unique because it was meant for um, identifying as Chicana Latina individuals, and that is exactly what I needed because they understood me without having to be too vulnerable because that's still an issue for me. But they understood, and that was the nice thing about this group. Like I said, I do love hearing stories, and sometimes those stories can be chismes, <laughs> <laughs> which is how I heard about the HSI Undergraduate Advisory Board opportunity through El Chisme, which is El Centro's newsletter. <laughs> I was motivated, yes. Um, El Centro is a very main character in my, in my story at UC Davis. I was motivated to apply to be a member of the first HSI Undergraduate Advisory Board because I noticed that during the transition back to in-person, a lot of younger students were not aware about the spaces or resources offered and meant to them for them uh, in, on campus. And I, was also, I also noticed the pandemic had affected a lot of the ability to have some of these programs happen that had helped me so much in the past. Hearing how my peers did not know where to go to seek support when they were going through their own hardships, I decided this was how I could be of help to them. Our undergraduate advisory board is composed of 10 student leaders in different spaces across campus, such as Clinica Tepati, Danzantes del Alma, KDVS Radio Station, the SRRC, VetMed, and Campus Tours. I am very happy to hear how some of these programs that have helped me in the past are now coming back, such as Mento Menudo and Aggie Senior Weekend. Now looking back, as I'm about to graduate, I think about the challenges I faced, who and what helped me, and how I can use those experiences to help future students. I think the relationships within my involvement have built, within my moment, involvement are what have built and convinced me that to believe in myself, and that I will succeed even if I have struggles. I have realized the importance of surrounding myself with a community that has the best interest in mind. 
Knowing the people I look up to are willing to go above and beyond to support my success made me question myself, well, if they believe in me, why don't I believe in me? And I truly believe this support from my community is what had, has made me look at myself in a different light, one where we didn't give up and now are earning three degrees. Thank you all for your time. Alondra, thank you very, very much for sharing with the experience because it shows the resilience and the perseverance of our community, La Raza, both in attaining our degrees and pursuing to create change. So thank you very, very much. I hope we could get Raquel back on um, because now we want to open it up for questions to, to the group. Any questions out on the floor for our panelists? Good morning. Uh, this is uh, for um, uh, Alonda. Uh, the question I have is, how, how did you see the pandemic affect your peers and how did it affect you on campus in terms of your academic progress, your mental well-being, and uh, frankly, the completion and progress of students? Of Chicano, Ch Ch Chicanx Latinx students. Yes. Um, I definitely saw and heard from just conversations or even on social media, a lot of my peers would post about them. And the thing about, within my peers, a lot of them try to joke about the struggles they're facing and making them seem like less, but in reality, we all know that you, we, they are struggling with mental health and they are struggling financially and they do, on top of academics, have other responsibilities and family because we all know that once we go to home, it's not just school, right? Tu mamá te pide que lleves a tu hermano a la escuela, que recoges, uh, recojas a tu abuelita, que la lleves a no sé dónde, and it's just these other responsibilities on top of academics that you don't, that you're not having, now having. Um, sorry, would you mind repeating the, the second part? Uh, personally, that, that, that also affected me and my peers, the having other extra responsibilities at home. I think that also adds on extra stress because you don't feel comfortable saying no to your family. Uh, and my peers, once we came back to in person or hybrid, we all did have a conversation about this. And we do, I, I think I'm glad to have a communi uh, yeah, community and peers that are open to having these com conversations because they offer support that you would, I would not tell my mom, tengo ansiedad y a veces no puedo y me pongo a llorar y me desespero. But talking to my peers makes everything more manageable and it makes you feel like you have people that are there for you because they're going through the same thing. Thank you, thank you, Alondra. Good morning, Caroline Cubillas, UC Davis. Um, several of you have commented this morning about the, uh, uh, the difference of alumni in these spaces. Uh, Francisco uh, commented on it, uh, Lupe Gallegos from Berkeley commented on it, and a couple of others. So, so can you talk about, Francisco, what is the difference? Why, why is there a difference and why is it important to talk about alumni engagement? I think that there are uh, a, a couple of, of reasons. Uh, as a 1970 graduate of Berkeley, most of the, regret, the uh, regrets, most of the requests <laughs> that I get from uh, from the uh, the university are uh, come to a tailgate, uh, join the alumni council, and go to the lair of the bear. Uh, give us money. Give us more money, and we'll decide what to do with it. And um, I think that for alumni of our community, we have to be involved differently because we're not represented enough. Our interests are not represented enough within the university, especially in the management um, of it, in the policy development, in the practices that are developing. So I think um, <clears throat> for that reason, one would be to be of influence. The second is that we have a set of unique experiences and unique expertise. As I mentioned, we survived 
the university. So you want the survivors because they know. They know what to do. They know how to do it. But more importantly, they know what services they would have needed to be even more successful. Right? Because we weren't asked, we didn't know about graduate school until my senior year. And they said, you know, you can go to school more. I go, you can? Um, that's for me. Uh, I like going to school. Uh, we didn't know the difference between a master's, an EDD, a PhD, a law degree, or, or anything else. And so we know that if, if introduced to that earlier, which people are doing now, there'll be m more of us. We didn't know how to become faculty. So I think it's, it's two things. It's ne necessity because of the experiences uh, that, that we have and of course the expertise that we have. We have much to offer the university, more than money, more than tailgates, and more than participation at, at ceremonies and luncheons. We're a valued resource. Thank you, Francisco. We definitely are changing the ecology of the institution, so these investments and these perspectives are very insightful and informative. We'll take one last question before we transition to the, uh, the next part of our programming. Thank you. I appreciate the uh, comments uh, and the presentations. I'm Robert Awayo, class of 73. Uh, I was one of the first to throw stones on this campus and cause racial tension. We were the disruptors that helped create a lot of the infrastructure that now on campus, the financial aid system was non-existent. Student services, student affairs were uh, just starting out in their infancy. And we continue as part of the council uh, to continue that advocacy to make the university much better, as Francisco quoted. Um, my question is, is also about the task, the HSI designation. Once a campus is designated as HSI, the game is not over. And I think that's when the real work starts. And I'd like to hear comments from uh, Raquel and Francisco about those challenges after designation. So I want to make note, uh, Raquel is not available. She went to teach our future law, uh, lawyers to represent these issues, <laughs> especially as it relates to legislation designation. But uh, the question is posed to the panelists on servantness to the, uh, becoming the HSI. Um, I don't mean not to answer the question, but actually Alondra will know more about what her, what her needs are uh, today. I can tell you what, what uh, our role would be, and our role would be to do whatever she asks uh, <laughs> of us. Um, and so we are, uh, and because we're here to serve, so Alondra would know about what would be serving and what serving with a big S means. Yes, so um, like it was mentioned, the work does not stop there. There's a lot that needs to be done, and although yes, there are programs that are getting better and are getting more specific towards certain communities, I think that's definitely something that still has to go, that has a long way to go. Um, like Adelantes Mujeres, it was specifically for Chicana Latina women. I think there's uh, programs like that that have to be made maybe for men's mental health, maybe for uh, LGBTQIA plus communities' mental health. And we recently had a mental menudo that was um, open to the, uh, was to allies, but it was meant for, um, the LGBTQ plus community, but imagine if they had a group like that that met every week for them. How good would that be? How how seen do you, do you imagine they they would feel in their on their campus? Um, another thing for me, big thing for me is mentorship. Mentorship programs, not just for the mentees, but also for mentors. They help see you in another. They help you see yourself as someone that has done has gone through a lot and that can also has a potential to help others go through their journey at UC Davis. I think that's also one of the main things that helped retain me here at UC Davis, knowing that I was helping others. And it, like, it's such a beautiful thing when my mentees would reach out to me because it was like, oh, like, I'm not just doing good, I'm doing great because I'm helping other people as well. Thank you, thank you, Alondra. I wanna uh, highlight one element. Uh, HSI schools uh, receive of 67 cents on the dollar to non-HSI schools. So you can see that there is a resource uh, shortfall. And uh, resources, uh, I have to recognize, 
and acknowledge that as, as a team, as a HSI, as a collective, I do want to recognize all those before us who have assisted to redirect and repurpose resources to support the success of our undergraduates. The Joaquins, the Alfreds from UCLA, the Nancy Alwork in the LA area, the various different talents who have been helping, including Rodrigo, to retain our students. With that said, use the power of a collective and structure and transform your HSIs. Thank you very much.